You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Estevan. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 203. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The HitItBoard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The Move It can. Go to HitItBoard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's HitItBoard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Elite Science. Unlock your dog's full potential with a unique competitive edge solution, 1TDC. 1-tetradecanol complex is a patented blend of unique fatty acid oils designed to safely and effectively keep joints and muscles at their best to maximize performance and shorten recovery time. 1TDC is the next generation of fatty acids and is used by many current and past national agility champions and world team members. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about our family vacation to SeaWorld. Of course, it was not just a vacation for our two children, ages 13 and 8, but we did a little bit of uh, work, quote unquote work as well, because we got to take a behind the scenes look behind the scenes like VIP tour of uh, the training that's going on with the animals there at SeaWorld, all different species, and talk with the trainers, almost one-on-one. It was a very, very small group, and ask them lots of questions about the work that they're doing over there at SeaWorld. One thing that we did want to mention right off the bat, we do realize that there is some controversy around SeaWorld, specifically having to do with the training of orcas. And there's been some documentaries and articles out about that. Uh, But we really wanted to focus on the training aspect because there was so much to be learned, uh, so much motivation from talking to the trainers about how they train all the different species of animals they have at SeaWorld. So that's the focus of this podcast. But if you are interested in learning more of the background of SeaWorld and their history and and some of the bad things that have happened, some of the good new direction that they're going as a company into conservation and education, you can do that online. But we want to focus on the dog training. Well, not the dog training, the training in this podcast. That's right. And everywhere we went on this tour, this behind the scenes tour, uh, you're reminded that the interaction between human and animal is very carefully, I need a better word than orchestrated. I was going to say constructed, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Nothing is done really haphazardly, right? Everything is planned. Everything is uh, structured. And it's I, I feel like uh, multi-purpose. So one is the safety of the animal, safety of the human, certainly. Uh, two is the relationship between human and animal. And I know a lot of you are instantly visualizing in your mind the dolphins and the sea lions, but there are many, many animals at SeaWorld, including a bald eagle, including a skunk. There are cats, there are dogs, there are birds, all of which are trained. Right. And they're all basically trained uh, the same way. And so we're going to talk about that. And so, Sarah, one thing that struck me right off the bat is when we went to visit the sharks, which is our first stop. Right. Right. And one thing that they don't do that I have seen in other aquariums, uh, but maybe this was a long time ago and this is a new trend now. They don't throw the divers in there with the food. <laughs> Seems like that seems like a solid, solid plan. Seems like a solid plan. And so very simple, very simple explanation for that. They don't want the sharks to associate people with the food because then when you see divers and people jumping in or let's say, you know, uh, someone accidentally fell in there, they would be like, oh, feeding time. Right. And all the instincts and behaviors associated with feeding uh, suddenly pop out. It's like when I see a donut, I smell a donut. 
I don't even need to be hungry, but it's going to elicit certain feelings of interest in my body that I may or may not be able to control. And so instead, they get around that by using hand targeting. And in this case, the hand targeting is not a hand. It is, in fact, a pole. So they got a long pole. You're going to stick your food on there. Or they got a long pole that they use as a target. The shark can touch that. And then they're going to get fed. Mm -hmm. But basically, they want to try and... um, dissociate it from humans. It's a little bit opposite of what we do. I think a lot of times with uh, dog training or, or with any of some of the other animals where you want, you want the, the animal to, to, with be, you. You because want them there's to such an, a positive yes, association. You want them to take an interest in you. Uh, but in this case, interest sharks is bad. <laughs> are, are, right, I don't want them interested in me. Right. They're predators. Uh, if you go to uh, zoos and safaris and uh, other places, they will tell you, uh, don't feed the animals. Don't feed these birds uh, for, for a couple of different reasons, right? You know, you're probably not going to be, you're probably going to be feeding them popcorn and human food and, and Snickers bars and things that they don't necessarily need to be eating and, and are not good for them, certainly. But also it'll draw undue attention and interest to you. That's and right. you may not, you may not want that. And so the shark story for me is a really great reminder of, all of the intricacies that are involved with uh, behaviors, just the relationship between behavior and the environment and our manipulation of that environment in order to create certain behaviors and in order to reduce certain other behaviors. Now let's bring that over to agility. Because as dog trainers, what we're doing is trying to create certain behaviors, weaving, uh, hitting the contacts, on the uh, dog walk A-frame and teeter, uh, jumping and keeping the bars up. And we're trying to eliminate certain other behaviors. Let's say your dog slows down in the middle of a course and stops running and starts to sniff the ground. Oh, we don't want that. We would like that to be eliminated. Let's say your dog won't sit at the start line. They get up and they start barking at you. That's a behavior we probably want to see eliminated. So we have behaviors that we want. We have behaviors that we don't want. And now we've got to figure out how do we go about getting these behaviors And the very, very cool thing, I think uh, maybe the key point of all of this is when you're working with animals that are significantly larger than yourself, and when you're working with animals that can simply get away from you, right, your training methods are going to be a little more limited, in a sense, than they would be for a dog. Because I think the vast majority of us, even the smallest person who owns the biggest dog, you are, in fact, bigger than your dog. Right. So to me, a 70, 80, 90 pound dog, that's big. That's really big. I weigh a hundred pounds more than that. All right. To give you some sense of size, the biggest dog might be 26, 27 inches at the shoulder that I've worked with in agility. I am six feet tall. Right. So if, if height is an indicator, height and size are indicators in the animal world of, I don't know, um, hierarchy or, or rank or status or any of those things. Certainly humans in general are on the, uh, the higher end of that uh, stick between dog and human. And on top of that, we have fenced yards, right? We have fields with barriers around them. We have leashes and collars that we use with these dogs. All of those things give you uh, control over the dog in uh, training, performance. And these things are not available to many of these animals, or to the trainers who are working with these animals. And so a lot of the things that we might do in training, like uh, putting putting a leash on a dog, simply cannot be done. And so that's why I think it's instructive to go see what they're doing, because they're doing really amazing things. So we went there, and so here are some of the things that really stood out to me. They taught a sea lion to smile, and it really looks like that dude is smiling. He's got his little sea lion and whiskers out there. And how great is that for pictures? Showing you all the <laughs> teeth, and it turns out it's a pretty handy skill to have because when they do that, now you can brush your teeth, right? Or there's take a, a picture with there's the There's a husbandry kids. <laughs> issue or a picture for, for the fans. Absolutely. Another one that I was really, really impressed with, with was dolphins swimming for an extended length uh, or amount of time upside down. Mm-hmm. Underwater, upside down, on their back. That is remarkable. How do you teach that? Do you think you can put a leash on them and, and suddenly flip them around and start dragging them around? No, you can't, Right. The seahorse position that dolphins have, where their entire body is out of the water and just their their flipper 
is in the water the and tail. they're moving away mm-hmm. from you, the right, tail. Right, right, right. And they're moving away from you backwards, like they're facing you, their right, belly right, right. and... and and um, I guess the ventral surface is uh, facing you, right? And the dorsal, they're moving away from you. That's really impressive, where they look kind of like a seahorse. Right. Yeah, that is an amazing, remarkable skill. And so they're doing these behaviors that are incredible. But you know what? Our dogs do incredible behaviors too. And I think we kind of lose sight of that when we go to all these dog shows. We're around agility so much, but... It's always a show like Westminster where you get a lot of non-dog people, or I'm sorry, non-dog agility people. They cannot fathom. That your dog can weave. Right. The weaving is probably their most favorite obstacle, and it's such a, it's a beautiful skill. You, unlike a jump that's, that happens so quickly and is over right away, you get a good three seconds to watch a dog weave, right? It's visually very, it's, it's captivating, Right. So I, I think the, I think of the weave poles when I think of, uh, behavior similar to what we were seeing at, uh, SeaWorld. Difficult to train, right? Obviously not an easy thing to do. Okay. So they're doing all of these amazing behaviors. And today we're going to talk about two very specific aspects of the training. And number one is their use of differential rewards, which we have talked about in other podcasts. And number two, is how they deal with mistakes, which we've also talked about in other podcasts. But I think it's very interesting to get it from the Sea World side. I think it reinforces a lot of what we're already doing and what a lot of you people listening to this podcast are already doing. Uh, it's a little bit like preaching to the choir, but it's so exciting and motivating to see it in action. It re-emphasizes the importance of these things, that they can be so central to how the training is done for so many different kinds of animals. When I review videos and people's performances and they show me runs that aren't great or dogs that aren't running all out in all positions, I think we lose sight of the training process. And what we're looking for is handling fixes. And certainly that's where I started, right? I just took all the training stuff for granted. So if we think back way back when to five or six years ago, when I first started the blog, Bad Dog Agility, like, what am I going to talk about? I talked about a handling situation, right? That came up at tryouts and people weren't handling it very well. Here's your fix. This is what you could do as a handler. And then um, as we expanded, as we started um, um, really looking at all different aspects of agility, The thing that comes up over and over again is the process, how you train, because that's where a lot of problems that show up in the ring need to be addressed. That's where you're weak. Knowing that you can do this handling maneuver, this handling maneuver, okay, that may fix your problem, that may fix it temporarily, but it's not going to really dramatically increase the overall speed of your dog, your dog's motivation to do the sport, uh, to weave faster. And so the solutions in our sport, the majority of them, in my opinion, are things that need to take place in the training field. It's how we teach our dogs, how we reinforce our dogs, how we deal with our dog's mistakes. To me, that's 90% of it. The other 10% is where you do this front cross. Let's fix your front cross footwork so you're not you know, spending forever trying to do your front cross. Uh, here's a good spot to do a blind cross. Here's a good spot to do a rear cross. Maybe run a little bit faster, maybe build a little more distance skill. Those things are important, but I think most of what we need to get done happens in the training field. And so let's go back and take it back to uh, the rewards, all right? So the first thing that you think of, let me ask you, although you know you know all the answers because you were there. <laughs> okay, let's pretend. Pretend you hadn't gone there. Right. Or w- let me ask you, before you went over there, what would you say their main method of reinforcement is? You fish. Know, for, f- okay, fish. You went, you, okay, you went there. And that's absolutely correct. They give their animals fish. And here we're talking specifically about the, the dolphins, the orcas. The, sea lions. Uh, the, the sea lions. Okay. Fish, fish, fish. Surprisingly, shockingly to me, they use something else. Can you guess what that is? Well, yes. <laughs> All right. T- tell me what I'm thinking. Read my mind. What was the thing that surprised your husband when he went to SeaWorld and, and saw the uh, animals being rewarded with this? I-, I bet the thing that was most surprising was ice cubes. 
ice. They were giving these animals buckets of ice. I was like, what are you doing? Are they thirsty? No, it turns out that uh, they find the ice pretty rewarding. And Because what um, is all ice always go with? Exactly. Fish. So, so <laughs> we're back to the it fish. It turns out the fish comes packed in ice. And so there's a very strong association right away with the, um, the ice and the fish. And I thought that was super interesting. There, there are other rewards that they use. And so what other rewards can you think of that you recall seeing there? And we'll see who can remember more. Uh, well, they did like rubs. You know, they would yes. rub their body, which yes. is just, I mean, that's petting, right? It's another word for petting, rubbing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What else would they do? Tongue scratching. Tongue scratching. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. Weird, cute. right? They yep. have the big tongue and yep. they're like rubbing Huge the tongue. Huge tongue, okay. like the big, big, uh, you know, I'm thinking like the beluga whales yeah. and the orcas. I think all of these things them. kind of go under physical contact. Yes. Right? And we have a um, a, a parallel a correlating behavior with our own dogs, right? The belly rub. That's right. The padding, the rubbing. But here's where I think it's a little bit different. I feel like the trainers were very conscious that this was a reward in their in their range of rewards. It was not like I'm petting this dolphin because the dolphin's cute and sweet and I like it. I mean, although that is part of it, it was specifically used as a reward. Right. I'm going to mention a couple of other rewards that we saw, maybe a little more subtle so we didn't notice, or, or most people aren't going to notice. But one was the use of verbal praise, mm-hmm. right? So they do a lot of stuff with their voice, and one, one of it is uh, praise. You often see it paired with a, another reward or, or reinforcer. And then uh, squirting them with a water hose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then toys. So they would have these like big barrels and things that float that they can play with that you could chuck out there and throw. And all this should sound very familiar to you as the dog trainer because we have all of these things with our dogs. Who has not out there squirted a hose? Like everybody knows a dog that loves to bite or jump at the water in the hose or or play with a sprinkler. In fact, you got to be a little careful about that to avoid uh, acute water intoxication and drinking too much water. And will chase a ball or a tug or interact with you or enjoys a good uh, belly rub or the verbal praise. So the repertoire of rewards here are very much the same. But as you mentioned, it's the deliberate use of them and then structuring them. So how do they structure them? Well, it turns out, and I, I was very specific on this question when I talked to the trainer. I was like, okay, hey, you, you guys have this great protocol, this standard that you're using. You know, you kind of want all the trainers doing this. But are there differences between animals? If we look at, say, these um, five sea lions... Is one of them going to really love the ice and then one of them is really going to love the fish and the other one doesn't like either one but really loves to be rubbed? And the trainer said, absolutely, yes. And they said it was really important to figure out what the animals wanted. Uh, one of the most... The individual animals wanted. Right, want. exactly. One of the most interesting uh, side conversations that I felt like we had while we were there was with one of the more senior trainers. And uh, the question was... Once you've learned how to train these animals, how easy is it to bring in a new trainer and have them train it? Or how easy is it for you who has been working with dolphins for the last 10 years, even though you have experience with some of the other animals, to go to a completely different species, go train the penguins or the sea lions or some other animal? And the thing that she said that really struck me was she said, well, I know how to train. And what I would really need to know from their regular trainer is, okay, tell me, what is this animal like? What what are their favorite rewards? Give me their top three. And that was the most important thing she needed to know from the animal's regular trainer to be able to show up like having never seen the animal and start training it. And then the second thing she said was, and then the animal was like, I don't really know you, but you've got all the stuff I like, so I think I'll work with you today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it reminds me, you know, dog agility, right? I remember even when I was first working with Susan's dogs, yeah, Gitchy's mother, Gree, and the first thing I want to know is, okay, what's the thing that this dog finds most motivating and is willing to work for, right? And it was their bumper, uh, you know, golden retriever retrieving bumpers. They'd done a little bit of field work, but that's the reinforcer that I want to use. They find it most um, uh, reinforcing, 
right? And so it doesn't make sense to use things that your dog doesn't really want. So many people out there really want a dog that tugs, but their dog is much more food driven. Yes, go ahead and continue to develop your desire uh, for the tug. And hopefully you can incorporate that into your agility where you're actually sequencing and rewarding with that. You can use it in the ring because you can take your leash in there. And in many organizations, you, you're allowed to tug on your leash. In some, you're not. So, you know, pay attention to your rules. But if what your dog works for best now is the food, you know, I would find ways to incorporate that into your sequencing. So we need to be a little bit smart about this. Right. I think, you know, that's a really important side note that I want to emphasize. Uh, and I want to reiterate what you said, which is you can work on tug drive. You can teach it as a skill. And the thing that I want to highlight is you have to be honest about where you are in that process and whether or not you are at a point where tugging is rewarding. So it's about being honest with yourself about your different re rewards and how rewarding they actually are to the dog. Well, this naturally leads to the question, how do you know a dog likes something or doesn't like something? And I think as people, we try and guess based on their reaction. If they don't play with the toy with us very much or very well or in a way that we think is quote unquote good, we're going to say, well, they don't have much drive for the toy and for the food, right? If they eat the food quickly and they look like they want some more, you know, then we're like, okay, they really like the food. But I think that those are things that are less easy to see in a dolphin or a sea lion. So what are the trainers using to figure out, well, how do we know that, uh, you know, this animal likes this or that or the other? And what they do is they look at the behaviors that they're looking for, right? So if they give something and that behavior increases, then they say, wow, this animal finds it reinforcing. And if it doesn't seem to affect the behavior, then they're like, you know, maybe maybe this isn't the right reward for this animal or this isn't this animal's most favorite reward, right? So they look very closely at the behaviors, at the thing that you are trying to get. So for example, in dog training, I think if you are doing, uh, let's just start with a very basic example. You're teaching a dog how to sit. You sit and you're offering them a uh, sliced up piece of hot dog right? And then the dog just wanders off. All right. So maybe that hot dog is not very reinforcing. And then you come back with, I don't know, a smelly piece of fish. And then the dog is like, oh, I am sitting. And after they eat, boom, they're sitting again. So now we have a reward that has caused an increase in a particular behavior, right? It, you know, with the hot dog, dog's wandering off. So you're not getting that other behavior, right? You're getting a behavior that you don't really want, actually. And then you bring out the fish and now you've gotten two repetitions of the behavior that you're looking for. And now a third and now a fourth focus is good. Okay. So this dog finds this reinforcing. And so that's maybe a little bit easier way to think about it. You know, really looking at your dog's behavior. It's like an extra half step that you need to take rather than guessing, right? Based on the quality of the interaction. It, it, you know what it's like? It's like saying this dog eats this food slowly. They must not like it. Otherwise, they would eat it very quickly. Or if my dog is not tugging really strongly and pulling me to the ground, they don't really love the tug. It's not reinforcing. And that may not be true. What you need to look at is the behavior that goes before that you're rewarding. Is that happening more often? Are they quick to go and do that behavior again or not? I think that's a very subtle distinction, but an important one. Otherwise, you're going to make mistakes as far as setting up your dog's uh, reward structure. Uh, one other note is I mentioned the verbal praise that they're using. I like mixing that in there. So a common critique that I hear about clicker trainers is it's all clinical. It, yeah, it's so dry, you know, click and you give them a piece of kibble, click and you give them a piece of kibble, and then they're just working for the kibble. I think when you say things like that, you don't really understand the training process very well because whether it's a piece of kibble or you're petting them or you're telling them, good girl, one. Or you have excitement in your voice. Yeah, one, everything is tailored to the dog. Right. Okay. And then um, number two, yeah, you can add that in, and I frequently do, so that there might be, um, if I click, I might say, good girl. I might say, good girl, with a different tone in your voice. Or I would say, I might say something like, good girl, and pat her down. 
mm-hmm. or now I'm saying good girl and I'm she's tugging and I'm patting her down while she's tugging, right? And the play is prolonged or I offer several rewards or other behaviors that you can tack on to that. And the interesting thing about the SeaWorld trip was that a lot of these animals, the the range of, of their hearing and they're underwater, it, it, there's no point in talking to them, right? Ah, so they but, use different markers right? for the different animals. So right, some Wh- of them are- which, which lots of people understand the use of like a whistle versus a clicker because they can hear it better. But the thing that I found interesting is those animals that do hear in the same register as us, they do use verbal praise for those animals. Mm-hmm. So they they do add that in. There's just no point in doing it when the animal can't hear it or perceive it or doesn't perceive it very well. Right. So dolphins are getting whistles. Sea lions are getting a lot of verbal stuff because of the hearing frequency that they have. Right. So they really tailor it to the animals. All right. So to summarize the first part of this podcast, SeaWorld trainers like dog trainers, are using differential rewards. And they are tailoring it to the individual animal. So every trainer for every animal, for those of you out there running a couple different dogs, you should know that this dog likes this more than anything else, while this dog likes something else more than anything else. And you should kind of have an idea of where their hierarchy of rewards are so you can appropriately use them. All geared toward developing this idea of a reward, small reward, little r, uh, versus the jackpot, the J, that we're going for in training when they do things that are particularly brilliant. And then we can kind of shift their behaviors that they offer in the direction of whatever we have just jackpotted. And now for the second part of this podcast, we're going to talk about how they deal with mistakes. And this I found fascinating because it took a couple trainers for me to figure out that there was some park-wide policy. Absolutely. I hadn't done any prep. You know, this was a total vacation move. We were not thinking this was going to be anything that we were going to do with, um, you know, the podcast or with dog training. And then it kind of just fell in our laps because there were so many interesting things and we were, we had such good good access access and you're asking all these questions and they were very willing to talk about their, uh, uh, training. was a little bit of a teacher's pet here. Always, always, always had the, the next question. Are there any more questions? Always had a question. <laughs> not, not always, not always. I, I think that's an unfair characterization, and I did not monopolize the instructor's time in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. Uh, but I think it was the second trainer who mentioned this phrase to us. It is called the least reinforcing scenario. So they called it that the first time. Uh, without any kind of pause. So in your head, when you're listening to it, oh, you know, and then what we do is we try and create a least reinforcing scenario and then blah, 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 blah. You're like, okay. And then when the second person said least reinforcing scenario, suddenly in my mind, I was imagining capital letters, right? For, for the L and least, the R in reinforcing, and then the S, the scenario. And so I wanted to write it down and make sure I got it right. And it turns out if you Google the phrase, a lot of stuff is going to come up about oceanarium training, actually. And so one of the issues that you're going to have as an organization, in this case, the organization being SeaWorld, is you're going to have tons of trainers. All right. We didn't just talk with one or two trainers. There's one or two trainers overseeing everything in the park. There are dozens of trainers. Uh, training more than, do I bet all there's different, you hundreds. think there's hundreds. I mean, the number of animals is astronomical. Right. And then it's not just about the animals that are in the shows, which is already a very, very large number, but every animal under their care has to have some amount of training just to be able to care for the animal. Right. And so what you want to do as an organization, in the same way that McDonald's kind of standardizes their hamburgers, are you want someone to walk into a McDonald's in New New York and walk into a McDonald's in Los Angeles and basically eat the same food, have the same experience, um, receive the same service from the people there. And obviously you want to bring everyone up to the level of your best trainer. And so when they decide on these training techniques, basically you're going to gravitate towards the ones that work, right? And so this is something that they have found very, very effective in their own training. And uh, I was both surprised and not surprised to hear that they do it because it is, in fact, what we recommend for dog training. And a lot of people don't do or quite do yet, but we think they're getting there. And um, so let's talk about the least reinforcing scenario. What is it? 
So give me the one liner on what it is. So the way they explained it was they just want to give no reinforcement to the animal for a short period of time, two seconds. Yeah. So basically they're in training. The dolphin makes a mistake, right? They're like, they're like doing multiplication tables with the dolphin. They're like, what's three times three? And the dolphin's like nine. And they're like, four times two is eight. And they're like, five times five. And the dolphin's like 22. And it's wrong. Okay. So the dolphin gets it wrong. And the trainer basically stops. But there's a specific way they're supposed to stop. And it's in a relaxed way. Not in right? an angry not way. Not in an angry way. Not in a rigid way, way. A right? threatening manner. They just come to a stop. And the trainers that we were talking to basically cited oh, a three-second rule, right? We're going to stop for three seconds. And then, and this is critical, what do they do? They ask they, for they, a behavior. They, right. They ask for behavior. And the most common behavior, uh, simple behavior is, is number one. The most common simple behavior that they were looking for to reinforce was calm attention. Now, uh, for people who are, uh, are VIPers, right? You you train with us uh, year round in bad dog agility. This is something that you are very very familiar with, a concept that you're very familiar with, uh, because it's one that I keep mentioning to you. And for those of you that have incorporated it into your training, you're seeing amazing improvements in your dog and their enthusiasm, their motivation, their ability to come back after a mistake and stay on task and not wander off and not sniff the ground and to run a little bit faster. And those are things that are going to lead to improvements in the ring. So what they call calm attention, you would call, I know, because this is the phrase that comes up over and over and over and over again, eye contact. People are saying, oh, my dog is wandering off. There's n- they're not doing anything that I can reward. Right. And we're like, what about eye contact? If they just look your way, because over time that becomes attention, Right. And that becomes focus and that becomes paying attention to you, which is what we want. And the way that they explained it at SeaWorld, which I thought was very smart, was, I mean, it's a very, um, it's a very simple behavior and it's very useful. Like if you happen to be over rewarding a very large, potentially dangerous animal for calm behavior, you're getting an added side benefit of you are creating an animal that is more likely to be calm in the future in situations where they may feel a little frustration at not having gotten the reward for that two second pause, that three second least reinforcing scenario. So some animals, when they miss out on a reinforcement, they're a little bit upset about it. And we know some dogs that get that way too, right? They do something wrong. They don't get a reward. And some dogs, their response is to bark, to spin, to nip, right? right? So these are all... Um, Body slam the handler, jump on the handler, right, exactly. try to take the toy. And, and so we're actually in somewhat of a similar situation where some animals' response to missing out on reinforcement is the response itself is negative. So not only have they not done the thing that you asked them to do, they leapt off of the contact, right? So there was one mistake, but then they immediately follow that up with a behavior you don't want. And so now you take this idea of, well, we're going to immediately start rewarding them for an alternative, easy behavior that has a side benefit of being useful in our overall relationship. All right. Now let me ask the people out there, if you have one of these dogs and your dog is turned and is barking at you after a mistake, especially at a trial, this happens all the time. Are you cueing your dog to do the next thing? And the answer is yes, right? Your dog is barking at you, barking at you, and you're like, tunnel, come on, go take the tunnel, you know? Uh, Go take this jump or come on back over here. You're providing them with cues. And one of the things we know that cues do is they reinforce the behavior before, right? It's this whole idea of a behavior chain. When you um, have a dog, they stay at the start line, and then you tell them tunnel. Tunnel's the first obstacle. The cue to take the tunnel is actually a reinforcement of the start line state that they just had, right? And so now your dog's barking at you, they're jumping at you, they're biting you, and you're like, tunnel, tunnel. You are, in fact, reinforcing that behavior. And so here's the difference between the uh, fair trainer and the gray trainer. The gray trainer is going to wait until all that nonsense stops, More importantly, it doesn't really matter what's going on. They're just not going to reinforce that. What they're really doing is not waiting for something to stop. They're looking for something to reinforce. Again, a fine distinction, but an important one. 
And so when I'm out there and I've got a dog and they're acting all crazy, I'm looking for a moment when they're not barking, biting, nipping, preferably paired with eye contact. And as soon as I find that moment in between, uh, you know, uh, two, two barking fits, I'm going to click and reinforce it. And then I'm not going to expect the dog to suddenly stop and shut it down. I fully expect them to bark and do the other behaviors again. And again, I'm ignoring that because I'm very carefully watching them for the behavior that I can reinforce, the thing that I want to see happen again. And then I can go on, right? And I want to iron all this stuff out in training. So at the trials, I can do the exact same thing because it doesn't make sense to suddenly change your behaviors, you as a handler, what you're reinforcing in trials, right? So if you're great at home at waiting them out and then at trials, you're just sending them on. Well, now that now the dog just learns there's context, I can, I should do it this way at home and I should do it this way at trials and they're different. We want to make them the same. And so what I'm telling you is if your dog is giving you one of these undesirable behaviors, you want to look for something that you can reinforce, something that you desire. And it doesn't have to be doing whatever behavior it is. If you're working on weaves and the dog's sitting there and barking at you, you're not trying to get them back into the weaves to reinforce the weaves, right? We're going to look for a simple behavior, something easy. I like eye contact, but that's what these trainers out here at SeaWorld are doing. They're using simple behaviors and they say quite specifically that they're looking for simple behaviors where the animal is calm. I think for me, one of the things that I found most striking about the trip and all of the side discussions that we got to have with the trainers was the fact that this is a a style of training that I'm familiar with that I know is very prevalent among marine trainers that, you know, if you've read any of Karen Pryor's books or any of the histories of dolphin training throughout the years, we know that this is how they train typically. But what really got me was every single trainer, every single one was saying the same thing. It was not like the best marine mammal trainers are using this. It was every marine trainer at SeaWorld, at least, that we spoke to was using this particular idea and this way of dealing with mistakes. And it wasn't even a question. Mm -hmm. It was was absolutely what they were going to do. Every single one of them was reacting the same way. Every single one of them had taken the emotion out of, of the training process. Every single one of them was using... The differential rewards. Okay, it would, we definitely need to talk about that because when we had uh, Max on, the winner of the European Open, our 18-year-old phenom, one of the things he talked about was taking emotion out of the training. When I did that years and years ago, it really changed the way I trained. And now I can recognize that when I am becoming emotional, I am, when you review your videos of training, I am not as good, right? I'm missing out on opportunities to reinforce, Right. And um, in general, I'm very good now about just ending a session, right? I know that I'm frustrated for whatever reason, and I'm just going to uh, stop working with the animal. There, there's an but opportunity you, to go backwards instead of yeah, forwards yeah. when you're in that state. So you definitely want to remove the emotion uh, from the training. The other, I think, really good subtle point to make here is that you are not ignoring the animal. So when the dog is jumping on you and barking at you and things like that, Years ago, this was true when I worked with uh, many different trainers. They all tell you the same thing. They would say, ignore the dog. We're not ignoring the dog. They they would recommend things like turning your back to the dog. How many of you have been told that, right? Dogs jumping up on you, try and turn your back to the dog. Look up at the sky. Don't make eye contact. And it is just ingrained in us so that as soon as I'm working with dogs, quote unquote, have problems, focus issues, which they do have. It's the first thing the handler does. They, they, They try and they do it instinctively. And I don't want them to do that, okay? And and the reason is we're not ignoring the dog. We're not trying to disconnect from the dog. In fact, we are showing the dog that we are intensely interested in what they are doing, but we are looking for something. And um, I don't need me looking at the sky and turning my back to the dog to be some kind of cue for this behavior. I'm going to remain focused on the dog and I'm watching them, I'm observing them, and I'm looking for that moment when they're offering me something that I can reinforce. And so it's very different from ignoring your dog, intentionally trying to detach yourself from the situation and and, and that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Am yep. I making sense there? Yep. Yeah, I think that's an important point to make. I think the other important point about the least reinforcing scenario, and this is something that 
I, I would say that the least reinforcing scenario is almost exactly the same as what I was calling a micro pause. I was calling it a micro pause that, you know, that you just take the, the briefest little break from reinforcing your dog and then you give them a, a the ability to, to basically start playing again, playing the game of training. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and one of the points that I made when we talked about micro pauses in another podcast, which I will link to because it is basically talking about this idea, was that in order for the dog to have a pause mean anything, a pause in reinforcement, they have to be getting a lot of reinforcement, right? Otherwise, what's the difference between a pause and just there being a long time between rewards? Oh, that's a really good point. This happens a lot with uh, trainers who don't pay attention to this kind of detail in training. Sometimes they can be beginner handlers. Sometimes they're experienced handlers. Um, but basically, as dogs progress, as you s- move away from doing one obstacle at a time in the teaching phase and you move toward the sequencing phase, especially when you do these sequences and now you make mistakes, they can go quite some time without getting a reward, right? You have seven obstacle sequence. You don't reward your start lines. You run the sequence. You make a mistake. You try again. You try again. You try again. You get halfway through it three different times. You've done 20 something obstacles, uh, even more behaviors on top of all, all of your obstacle performances none of which are getting a reward because you're not getting through the sequence successfully. So when your reinforcement rate is that low, for you to pause and not give rewards really loses a lot of meaning here because the dog hasn't been rewarded for the last three or four minutes anyway. Right. So I want to repaint the picture of a sequence to say that a sequence is actually a start line rewarded by the ability to do a jump, re- rewarded by the ability to do another jump, rewarded by the ability to do another jump, rewarded by a reward at the end. And the problem is that if that reward at the end doesn't happen, and it could be verbal praise, right, then that's where you get into trouble where there is no distinction between I just kind of stopped paying attention to you because the sequence was done and my mind was elsewhere. And Uh, I stopped paying attention to you because you did something wrong. You knocked the last bar or something like that. And so I think it's very important for people to really be very systematic about rewarding their dogs. And, you know, for those people who are like, well, I can't do X, Y, Z in the ring or at a show or whatever. Actually, yes, you can, because you need to incorporate some of these lesser rewards into your training to bridge that gap so that you can tell your dog they did a good job. Uh, but what you can't do is finish the last jump and just walk over to your leash and grab it and and not have any sort of interaction with the dog. And I think that occasionally that can creep into trialing and training where we it's just you've fallen into these routines where you're just moving through by rote almost. And I, th- I think sometimes that uh, online classes cause a little bit of this because we we get trainers so focused on getting something on tape that sometimes they kind of forget about the dog. So they start the recording, they run out in front of the camera, they do a sequence, and then at the end of the sequence, they run back to the camera and they kind of forget about, you know, rewarding the dog and then running back to the camera because they're preoccupied with these other things. So we have to remember to always get those rewards to our dogs. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And um, again, people who are working with me specifically, you're going to get a lot of uh, messages like, make sure you tape the 15 or 30 seconds before you enter the ring or you uh, start your practice sessions, and then I want to see the 15 or 30 seconds after. I really need to get a whole sense of the entire behavior chain, and usually I can um, find an area that you need to work on that'll help what's going on uh, between the start and finish line in uh, the trial situation. Yeah, I think those are uh, really great points. I think one other thing related to the emotion is not to drag out your three seconds. So I think for people... Three seconds often turns into 10 seconds and resetting the bar and making a sad face and, and I saying, think, uh, three seconds oh, is on the long side. you failed. You couldn't keep the bar up. Oh, no. Like, you know, let's do all of that. And I'm much more about, you know, finding something I can reinforce and then resetting the bar. I think the dog has a very acute sense. That's why I like your idea of micro pauses. R- really powerful concept. The dog knows, like, right away. 
You know, something is amiss. The flow has been interrupted. Mom has stopped handling. They know instantly something's gone wrong here. Um, maybe it has something to do with this bar. And so, you know, I, I think uh, people drag that on too long. Absolutely. You know, really need to get to the next thing. Uh, okay. So we've covered a lot of material here. This podcast has gotten, gotten much longer than um, I thought it would. So key training points. Let's go through them real quick so everybody knows what you should be uh, doing. Or if you're not doing it, think about doing it. Number one is the use of differential rewards. And finding what's rewarding to the particular right, animal. Tailoring it to the animal. You want to mix it up. And I, and I mean using it in a way that makes sense. You know, low value rewards, you use that for stuff that's okay. You know, they did all right. Anything they do brilliantly, man, you got to jackpot that. You know, I think that'll help you a lot in your uh, training. Uh, verbal praise, petting, I think people forget that. Uh, you do not need to be stingy with that. I like to do that all the time, even after a frank mistake. Like if they drop a bar, I'll, I might even say good good girl for a drop bar. That's actually an R. Like you're giving an R to a drop bar. It's a little little crazy, you know, I think in a, in a lot of people's minds. But some dogs, I think, kind of require that to keep them in the game. Otherwise, they check out and they, and they uh, wander off. So it depends a lot on the dog's history and all that kind of stuff. And the kinds of mistakes that they typically make. Right. I'm just saying it's not the end of the world if you reinforce a behavior that ultimately is going to be undesirable, but for now or in this session is acceptable. And so I think that's an important and subtle point to me. Okay. So differential reward. And number two is that for dealing with mistakes, basically having a timeout, but the timeout is not ignoring your dog or turning your back to the dog. It's really uh, watching and waiting for the opportunity to reinforce something that you want, something easy. Uh, you know, they calm down. Certainly you can stick your hand out and have them touch your hand with their nose. I think that's a nice, easy one, a default behavior. You teach them how to spin, have them sit. Recalls, I think, are even easier than that. And my personal favorite, of course, is eye contact. Right? That's right. So just incompatible with so many other bad, quote unquote, bad behaviors. It's very hard for your dog to stare at another dog and give them the eye or feel threatened by that dog when they're looking at your eyes, right? And so, and they also naturally want to come to you for the reward. So I think that is the second uh, very important part. And then number three would be to make sure that you're reinforcing at a high rate because uh, these micro pauses and things don't work quite as well, I think, without more uh, reinforcement. So when people have issues with their dog doing footwork on weaves and contacts and things like that, the first thing I'm going to say is we need to increase the value for th that. And people are like, okay, that makes sense. In fact, many people will say, my dog incorrectly went to the weaves today, even though I didn't cue it because we've been working really hard on the weaves that week. What does that mean? It means you increase the value for the weaves through that work and all the rewarding that you were doing. That also applies to other issues. So people are surprised to hear, oh, wait, I need to reward more for my start lines? But yes, you do in the same way that you're going to work on or try to fix your contacts or weaves. You want the dog to have some uh, love for that obstacle. So increase your reinforcement rate. Um, I think number four, the idea of taking the emotion out of your training. I really, really like that. I think people need to do a much, much better job of that. It really was an enjoyable trip. It was very motivating and exciting. We were ready to get back to our dogs, uh, ready for the heat of the summer to uh, taper off so that we could get back to some more intense training. And I will be surprised if this is the last mention of SeaWorld that's made on this podcast. There were lots of little nuggets that I'm sure are going to be relevant uh, as we tape future podcasts. But it was a really great experience. Really enjoyed that backstage uh, pass that ability to talk directly to the trainers. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, hititboard.com, Elite Science, and NTI Global. Accessories on the go. Compress that tunnel for storage or carrying with an NTI Global tunnel leash now in stock. Add those tamer bags to your tunnel to keep it weighted and in place. Hold equipment steady with some anchor bags. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com and use promo code MOVEIT20 
2018 NTI for 5% savings off today. Promo code good through September 30th, 2018. Happy training. My girlfriend is like the square root of negative 100. She's a solid 10, but also imaginary.